so we're in Act Two of uh, The Tempest. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I just wanted to briefly come back to, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it is the subplot, uh, because thus far we have only encountered the one man that survived the shipwreck, namely Ferdinand, whom uh, Prospero has designs upon to marry his daughter, and he's been separated from the rest of his crew who are on another side of the island, as it says in the uh, introduction here act two scene one another part of the island and now we will meet alonzo and sebastian and antonio and gonzalo and adrian francisco and and others in another place and this will be the subplot and the subplot uh, is interesting because it will it will then um talk about the significance of a of a desert island and what can be done from that and we will see that unlike prospero who does not see it as a political theater, but as a place for art to work to remedy through gracious action, the wrongs that have been done to him and the discord. And that's his whole purpose in the play is to do that. Unlike them in, scene, in act two, scene one, we will see the other characters who consider things in a political fashion, in a strictly worldly fashion. And that the juxtaposition of the two is telling. There, this is a, um, a very different way of looking at it. We must not see Prospero as merely exercising some sort of political tyranny or something like that, as if we're doing, dealing with two different types of politics. One is dealing with uh, the arts and the way in which the arts can be used to orchestrate charitable action in uh, remedying the faults of the world. We've seen this as consistent in Shakespeare's plays, that he sees art having this function, the imagination, having a reconciling capacity and a harmonizing that leads to love and uh, delight and harmony. And we also see how it can be done wrongly and it's largely through politics. When men try to orchestrate their own affairs without God's designs in sight and do selfish things, it, we saw in Midsummer Night's Dream, even in Athens, they, uh, under the, pl the very place where reason is supposed to hold sway, we see that a, a father is willing to kill his daughter because she doesn't, it, she doesn't want to marry the one that he wants her to marry. This is out of whack. It's not supposed to be that way. And art is going to rectify what politics and, reason, and mere reason cannot. But in act two, scene one, we see a very different scene where that is not in view. And to some degree, we're going to see the problems with the worldview that is not graced by God's grace and without that higher purpose in mind. I'm not going to read through it here, but um, just simply to um, alert you to that's what's going on here in Act 2, Scene 1, and come to the point where um, Caliban enters the scene. And where is this? And th this is when the aristocrats are gone away and all we're left with is the the odd individuals here. Um, oh, you're right, it's Act 2, Scene 2. You're correct. So Act 2, Scene 2, the commoners, the servants, confronted with Caliban. And we'll, let's observe some of the speech that goes on there. And it's yet another part of the island. Caliban getting the wood that he was commanded to get to serve Prospero. And he will come upon Trinculo. Enter Trinculo. And Caliban, in response to this entrance of a man, lo now, lo, here comes a spirit of his and to torment me for bringing wood in slowly. I'll lie flat. Perchance he will not mind me. So Caliban misunderstands who this individual is, having never seen another man on the island before. He thinks it's one of the spirits like Ariel, and it's going to punish him for being too slow with the wood. Decides to lie flat on the ground, and Trinculo then speaks. Now note again, I've noted this regularly, the commoners will speak not in verse but in prose. There's no harmony to their speech. 
their, their passions are intermixed with their reason and they reason badly. And they're very selfish in their thinking about things. And this is going to inform their speech about what they will do on the island here as well and how they will govern. What would a, what would a person who is motivated by solely selfish earthly concerns, how would that person govern? Well, he would be king, of course. He wants all the power. But there would be no harmony or order to that rule. It would just be monarchy in the sense of tyranny. Nothing uh, would guide it higher than that. But here's Tranquilo's speech. Uh, here's neither bush nor shrub to bear off any weather at all, and another storm brewing. I hear it sing in the wind. Yon same black cloud, yon huge one, looks like a foul bombard that would shed his liquor. If it should thunder as it did before, I know not where to hide my head. Yon same cloud cannot choose but fall by, by palefuls. And then he encounters Caliban on the ground because he said he'd lie flat. What have we here? A man or a fish, dead or alive? <laughs> a fish. He smells like a fish, a very ancient and fish-like smell, a kind of not of the newest poor John, a strange fish. Were I in England now, as once I was, and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there, uh, but would give a piece of silver, there would this monster make a man. Any strange beast there makes a man. And Shakespeare's audience is laughing at this point. He's poking fun at the English. Doesn't matter how ridiculous they look and how bad they smell, they're still all men. There's no... Uh, distinctions between uh, men and beasts there because everyone's a man or how beastly they behave. There would this monster make a man, any strange beast makes a man. When they will not give a doit to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out ten to see a dead Indian. Probably a reference, remember, the Frobisher brought back an Inuit from, um, from Canada and probably a commentary on that. Legged like a man and his fins like arms. Warm, oh my troth, I do now let loose my opinion. Hold it no longer. This is no fish, but an islander that hath lately suffered by a thunderbolt. So it's not that he doesn't look like a man. It's that I, he's probably had a little bit too much to drink. Alas, the storm has come again. My best way is to creep under this gabardine. There is no other shelter about. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. I will hear shroud till the dregs of the storm be passed. Now Stefano comes in and he's got a bottle. So we got two drunken commoners. And what will ensue? Oh my goodness. Now he's, he also is going to speak in prose, but when it comes to a song, then he's got everything that goes with a song, which is verse. And <laughs> Caliban sees himself in torment because he thinks these two are there just to drive him mad with their crazy talk. Do not torment me. Oh, what's the matter? Stefano says, have we devils here? Do you put tricks upon us with salv salvages and men of Indy? <clears throat> ha, I have not escaped drowning to be afeard now of your four legs, for it hath been said, as proper a man as ever went on four legs, cannot make him give ground. And it shall be said so again while Stefano breathes at the nostrils. The spirit torments me. Oh, this is some monster of the isle with four legs who hath got, as I take it, an ague. Where the devil should he learn our language? I will give him some relief, if it be but for that. If I can recover him, and keep him tame and get to Naples with him, he's a present for any emperor that ever trod on Neat's leather. Do not, he's gonna take him back as a spectacle. People will pay him. This is great, trophy. <clears throat> Do not torment me, prithee, I'll bring my wood home faster. He's in fit now. So misunderstandings between the two, they think, uh, Caliban thinks that they are tormenting spirits and they are not even sure what he is. And they see that he's on four legs because he's on the ground. He's got arms and legs. It's not, you know. 
under the influence of drink, whatever. So uh, comedy ensues in the original uh, scene here, and we'll pick it up here. And uh, Caliban is given drink by them as well, so then Caliban, Caliban also gets drunk. So now we have three drunkards <laughs> on the stage and the com all the comedy that ensues with that. So anyway, act three, scene one. And um, there'll be lots of discussion about um, the, uh, there was an act two, scene one, I, I'm, I, about the type of, of uh, political order that they will set up there, by the way. And um, I, I've skipped all over that. It's an important scene, but I am short on time. So act three, scene one, back in Prospero's cell. Now, Ferdinand comes in bearing a log. Now, Ferdinand, remember, who is uh, besotted with uh, Miranda, <coughs> doesn't feel anything of the labor of his task because, of course, he's still besotted with the vision of Miranda. And says this, there be some sports are painful and their labored delight in them serves off. Some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone and some and most poor matters point to rich ends. This is my mean task, would be as heavy to me as odious, but the mistress which I serve quickens what's dead and makes my labors pleasure. Oh, she is ten times more gentle than her father's crabbed, and he's composed of harshness. I must remove some thousands of these logs and pile them up upon a sore injunction. My sweet mistress weeps when she sees me work and says such baseness had never <coughs> like executor. Thank you. I forget, but these sweet thoughts do even refresh my labors more busiest than when I do it. So her father taxes him with harsh labor, which he would chafe under, but he does it for Miranda and suddenly it's all light. And so again, something of the grace of the, of the woman that he loves and love working upon him and perfecting him and pulling him out of even his tendency to chafe at uh, commandment. So something of the grace and the law here connected in the two and the father and the daughter here as well. But Miranda enters with Prospero, but Prospero is hiding, observing the spectator to the spectacle, wanting to see what's going on not probably willing to leave the two of them to their own devices, not knowing uh, him very well. But Miranda enters, alas, now pray you, work not so hard. I would the lightning had burnt up those logs that you are enjoined to pile. Pray set it down and rest you. When this burns, twill weep for having wearied you. My father is hard at study. Pray now rest yourself. He's safe for these three hours. So she wants to discharge him of the burden. She doesn't want to be burdened at all. Let me rest you. Let me soothe your temple. Let me give you. So she wants to show, dote upon him and love him. And Ferdinand, in response to the kindness, oh, most dear mistress, the sun will set before I shall discharge what I must strive to do. If you'll sit down, I'll bear your logs the while. Pray, give me that. I'll carry it to the pile. No, precious creature. I had rather crack my sinews, break my back, than you should such dishonor undergo while I sit la lazy by. It would become me as well as it does you, and I should do it with much more ease, for my good will is to it, and yours it is against. And then Prospero, observing the exchange, uh, says, poor worm. Thou art infected. This visitation shows it. Infected with what? Cupid's dart. You're, you're, you're going to do anything for him. You're, again, it's the Spaniel line from, act, from uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, let me be as your Spaniel. Fawn upon you. Strike me. I'll do whatever you want. That, so, and, and Prospero is enjoying this. There's, nothing, there's no harm in this. This is the effect of being in love. Miranda, you look wearily. No, noble mistress, tis fresh morning with me when you are by, by a night, at night. I do beseech you, when you are by 
uh, at night, I beseech you chiefly that I might set it in my prayers. What is your name? Miranda. Oh, my father, I have broke your hest to say so. Okay, she's not supposed to betray her name, but she then does so. And Miranda, I told you, is a gerund in Latin. It means to be admired. Miranda's problem on this island is there's nobody to admire her. Prospero is her father. When I say admire, to love her, there's nobody to love her. Caliban is not suitable. Caliban is a man uh, who is um, unworthy in every respect. But here he finds somebody, she finds somebody who is worthy to admire her in Ferdinand. And he picks up on the name, as I say, to be admired, admired Miranda. So there's a harmony in the meeting of the two. It's an Adam and Eve scene. Indeed, the top of admiration, worth what's dearest to the world, full many a lady I have eyed with best regard, and many a time the harmony of their tongues hath into bondage brought my too diligent ear. For several virtues have I liked several women, never any with so full soul, but some defect in her did quarrel with the noblest grace she owed and put it to the foil. But you, oh you, so perfect and so peerless, are created of every creature's best. I mean, it's sickening. <laughs> the whole thing is so sweet. I do not know one of my sex, no woman's face remember, save from my glass, uh, her mirror, mine own. Nor have I seen more that I may call men than you, good friend, and my dear father. How features are abroad, I am skillless of. But by my modesty, the jewel in my dower, I would not wish my companion in the, any companion in the world but you. Nor can imagination form a shape besides yourself to like of. But I prattle something too wildly, and my father's precepts I therein do forget. I am in my condition a prince, Miranda. I do think a king I would not so, and would no more endure this wooden slavery than to suffer the flesh fly blow my mouth. Hear my soul speak. The very instant that I saw you did my heart fly to your service. There resides to make me slave to it. And for your sake, am I this patient log man? He's willing to be a servant. Caliban is a slave unwillingly. Ferdinand is a willing slave, if it means that he can be in uh, service to his beloved Miranda, whom he delights to look upon. Do you love me? Oh, heaven, oh, earth, bear witness to this sound and crown what I profess with kind event if I speak true. If hollowly invert what best is boded me to mischief, I, beyond all limit of what else in the world, do love, prize, honor you. I am a fool to weep at what I am glad of. And then Prospero, fair encounter of two most rare affections. Heaven's reign grace on that which breathes between them. So again, note Prospero. He's the dramaturge figure. He's the audience. The audience is delighted at the, uh, the gracious love that is growing between them, the harmony between two human beings which he is delighted at because again, Miranda is meant to be admired, not to be uh, with her old father on a, a deserted island. Um, Wherefore weep you at mine unworthiness that dare not offer what I desire to give and much less take what I shall die to want. But this is trifling. And all the more it seeks to hide itself, the bigger bulk it shows. Hence, 
bashful cunning and prompt me, plain and holy innocence. I am your wife if you will marry me. <laughs> if not, I'll die your maid. To be your fellow, you may not deny me, but I'll be your servant, whether you will or no. So they immediately go, like she's, she's I'm your wife like that, but if not my wife, I'll be your servant. Total prostration, she adores him. She worships him. He worships her. As I say, it's sickening. <laughs> and delightful. But it, it's, it's, it has to be so. It, it's the character of love that we see in almost none of Shakespeare's comedies, but here it's an extended fashion. It's a romance. It, it's a, the genre's a romance. It's, it's the, in a sense, it's unrealistic, and it's deliberately so. As I say, it does not fit the political nature uh, and the political commentary of the contemporary critic. It just does not suit it at all. It's totally missing the point. This is idealized love in front of us, idealized. And so idealized that there's not a spot of blemish on it, which again, that's why I say it's sickly, this doesn't happen. This is not realistic. It's not supposed to be realistic. It's supposed to be idealized. And remember, this, could, this play could be commanded by the royals and was performed at weddings. And there's a mask in it in, in Act 4, which I'm going to get to, which will fit that very mannered, courtly way of uh, celebrating love, uh, residing directly within the play itself. But anyway, I think you have a bit, a bit of, of the character of this at any rate. But my mistress, dearest, and I thus humble ever. My husband then? I, with a heart as willing as bondage heir of freedom, here's my hand and mine with my heart in it and now farewell till half an hour hence so they're married and now okay i'll see you later <laughs> a thousand a thousand exempt Mer ferdinand and miranda separately prospero the spectator so glad of this as they i cannot be who are surprised with all but my rejoicing as nothing can be more I'll to my book, for yet ere, ere supper time must I perform much business appertaining. And then uh, leaves the stage. Now at this point, uh, in Act 3, Scene 2, we return to the drunkards, the three base characters, two men that came from the shipwreck and Caliban, all acting like buddies now, sharing the drink, talking about how they will act in this island because they see it from their vantage point as an opportunity. There's no kings here. There is one and his name is Prospero, but guess what? If we get rid of him, we can be the kings here. They don't know that the other nobles, by the way, are on the island. The, uh, Stefano and Trinculo think that they're on their own, right? And there's Caliban. The three of us will rule here and which one of us will be the ruler, well, they'll talk about that amongst themselves, but we have to get rid of Prospero. So there's a plot here. Stefano, tell not me. When the butt is out, as in when they drink the flask to its bottom, we will drink water. Not a drop before. I don't want to get rid of my drunkenness by combining it with water. When, when we're finished the drink, then we'll drink water. Therefore, bear up and boredom, servant monster, drink to me, servant monster, the folly of this island. The folly of this island. They say there's but five upon this isle. We are three of them. If the other two be brained like us, the state totters. So if they kill the other two, the state totters. They're Plotters, seditionists, drink, servant monster, when I bid thee. Thy eyes are almost set in thy head. Because he's like, his eyes are sl mere slits because he's had too much to drink. And probably the first time he's ever had alcohol. So, And then where could they be set else? He were a brave monster indeed if they were set in his tail. My man monster hath drowned his tongue in sack. For my part, 
the sea cannot drown me. I swam, ere I could recover the shore, five and thirty leagues off and on. By this light, thou shalt be my lieutenant, monster, or, or my standard. Your lieutenant, if you list, he's no standard. We'll not run, monsieur, monster, nor go neither. And, and, <laughs> and Calvin is sitting there the whole time while they're talking drunkenly, not knowing what to make of this. And then Stefano, moon calf, speak once in thy life, if thou beest a good moon calf. How does thy honor? Let me lick thy shoe. I'll not serve him. He's not valiant, so of Stefano, but to Trinculo. Uh, Trinculo, thou liest, most ignorant monster. I am in case to jostle a constable. Why, thou debauched fish, thou? Was there ever man a coward that hath drunk so much sack as I today? Wilt thou tell a monstrous lie, being but half a fish and half a monster? <laughs> Lo, how he mocks me! Wilt thou let him, my lord? Lord, quoth he, that a monster should be such a natural. Lo, lo again, bite him to death, I prithee. Trinculo, keep a good tongue in your head. If you prove a mutineer, the next tree, the poor monster's my subject, and he shall not suffer indignity. I thank thee, my, my, my noble lord. Wilt thou be pleased to hearken once again to the suit I made to thee? Mary, uh, will I? Kneel and repeat it. I will stand and so shall Tranquilo. So they immediately start play acting and who's the king? And I will serve you because then I will get rid of Prospero. So a plot, a mutiny is against Prospero and Miranda is afoot. We'll skip forward to Act 3, Scene 3. And what we are going to encounter here is Prospero teaching his characters a lesson. Now I've said, I've said to you that the Renaissance uh, playwright has two aims in mind in theater. One is to delight his audience, and a romance is particularly delightful. Although even in its delight, it's still teaching. And what it's teaching is about the nature of grace and the nature of love in reforming what is unreformable. Uh, what is by human designs uh, broken. And what is broken is the relationship between Prospero and his brother. It, it's, it's a broken relationship and, the, and his political loss is huge and he's been abandoned on this island. He's gonna have to remedy that. And in remedying it, he's gonna bring, bring about harmony again. But the harmony itself is teaching us about the nature of grace. But teaching is one of, again, the main aims for every Renaissance dramatist and for the dramaturge figures as well. They don't only want to fix things so the good guys uh, win and the bad guys lose. They want to teach every character, try to reform them potentially, give them an opportunity. So you see that in the plays. There's not immediate, oh, there's my enemy, I'm going to strike him down. There's an attempt to rectify it through some mediation. And Prospero is going to teach the characters a lesson here in Act 3, Scene uh, 3, and we get references here, if I can find Act 3, Scene 3, Scene 2. There we go. Uh, back to Alonzo Sebastian, Antonio Gonzalo, Adrian Francisco, and others. They encounter for the first time solemn and strange music. Very odd in the play, if you're not aware that music has different functions and has, is connected, and I talked about this before, with uh, different types of music. And this is three pages from the incunabula of Boethius's treatise on music. And note that it's connected to arith arithmetic and geometry as well. Um, as I say, is musical theory, threefold classification of music, the music of Mundana, music of the spheres in the world, not audible, music of Humana, the harmony of the human body, and the instrumental music. But they hear a music that is above them. It's from the spheres, it's, it's heavenly. And it's affecting a change on them which Prospero by normal human means could not affect. So when we think about the arts, 
even if they play music, there's a type of music here that is harmonized with the celestial music of heaven. That's what he's bringing in, and that's what they hear here. What harmony is this, says Gonzalo? My good friends, hark! Solemn, solemn uh, words. Solemn refers to reverent. There's something sacred here that brings a sort of holy awe over the, the assembly. Solomon, strange music it's called. What harmony is this? My good friends, hark! Marvelous, sweet music. Now the sweetness is often referred to the influence of the spheres. It's called sweet harmony. Often the sweetness is re referred to. But the sweetness is of that of, a, of a, an unearthly grace that our music only approximates and never entirely reaches. But when beautiful music pulls your heart upwards, it, it, it's above that. It's, it's at the high point of the soprano's voice. Above that, that's the music that is influencing the music that comes down from that. So now enter Prospero above, invisible. Enter step, and these are unusual for Shakespeare, the, the stage directions here. So he'll have to be let down by ropes in some way. So maybe he's up on some sort of pulleys and then they let him down on pulleys and he comes down from above. Enter several strange shapes bringing in a banquet. A banquet, it's a ceremony, it's a, 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 a marriage feast. They dance about it with gentle actions of salutation and inviting the king, etc., to eat, they depart. Give us kind keepers, heavens. What were these? What were these? A living drollery. Now I will believe there, that there are unicorns, that in Arabia there is one tree, the phoenix is thrown, one phoenix at this hour reigning there. Because this happens once in every thousand years. The phoenix rises and then it goes down in the ashes again and the phoenix is seen as a figure for Christ that rises from the dead and comes and so forth. Phoenix is often used in iconography of the period as a reference to Christ. So, and if I see this, I am minded of something that is miraculous and heavenly, figurative of, uh, of, a, of a miracle. Antonio, I'll believe both, and what does else want credit come to me? And I'll be sworn tis true. Travelers never ne'er did lie, though fools at home condemn him. If in Naples, I should report this now, would they believe me? If I should say I saw such islanders, for certes there are people of the island who, though they are of monstrous shape, yet note, their manners are most gentle kind than of our human generation, you shall find many, nay, almost any. And Prospero, in response to this speech, honest Lord, thou hast said well, for some of you there present are worse than devils. So there's the clash of the, ro the romance, reality, the heavenly place that Prospero has made the island to effect a gracious purpose. Just like in A Midsummer Night's Dream, they go into the, to the forest where the realm of imagination will first of all run wild, but then eventually through the gracious intervention of the uh, dramaturge figure, uh, effect a godly purpose, a goodly purpose to reconcile the opposite. Same thing is happening here, uh, even though they don't deserve it. It's unmerited grace. And Alonzo, I cannot too much muse on such shape, such gesture, and such sound expressing, though they want the use of tongue, a kind of excellent dumb discourse. Praise in departing. And because Prospero is still irked with him. Francisco, they vanish strangely, no matter since they have left their viands behind. Food, for we have stomachs. Will please you taste of what is here? Not I. Faith, sir, you need not fear. When we were boys, we would believe that there were mountaineers dew-lapped like bulls, whose throats had hanging at them wallets of flesh, or that there were such men whose heads stood in their breasts, which now we find each putter out of five for one will bring us good warrant of. I will stand to and feed, though my last. No matter, since I feel the best is past. Brother, 
my lord the duke stand to and do as we now thunder and lightning so there's spectacle here ariel will come down like a harpy and a harpy is a punisher of injustice they're wicked they punish those in the underworld they tear at their flesh it's like it's it's a treatment for those who are evildoers and ariel is disguising himself as a harpy uh, in order to terrify them and ariel says you are three men of sin whom destiny that hath to instrument this lower world and what is in it the ne never surfeited fee hath cost to belch up you and on this island where men doth not inhabit you amongst men being most unfit to live i have made you mad and even with such like valor men hang and drown their proper selves and they pull their swords out to defend themselves and Ariel, you fools i and my fellows are ministers of fate the elements of whom your swords are tempered may as well wound the loud winds or with bemocked at stabs kill the still closing waters as diminish one dowel that's in my plume my fellow ministers are like invulnerable if you could hurt your swords are now too massy for your strength so now they drop their swords because they, they get the weight is unbearable for them their swords go down and and will not be uplifted but remember for that's my business to you that you three from milan did supplant good prospero exposed unto the sea which hath requited him and his innocent child for which foul deed the powers delaying not forgetting have incensed the seas and shores yea all the creatures against your peace thee of thy son alonzo they have bereft and do pronounce by me lingering perdition worse than any death can be at once shall step by step attend you in your ways whose wraths to guard you from which here in this most desolate isle else falls upon your heads <clears throat> is nothing but heart sorrow and a clear life ensuing and now he vanishes in thunder and the shapes come down and prospero is delighted that he's terrified them with uh, the fires of hell effectively as a judgment now he uses this not to judge them and not to destroy them but to bring them to repent that's he has many designs on different actors in the play here and there's an allusion here probably to the aeneid and to the harpies which were sent because aeneas does not fulfill his divinely ordained duty this is it's a punishment and uh much like prospero's sh sh strange shape ariel enters like a, a harpy and snatches the food away um, so there's a lot of stage gimmicks in this play and very much with a royal audience in mind i think as i say at the black friars theater i probably a command performance for the king at one point we know that it did happen in 1613 uh, but ariel is a teacher here uh, a teacher of heart's sorrow he wants to teach repentance to them for what they did and they and and says that the reason that they are shipwrecked is because of what they did to prospero and his daughter so they've directly it's not an accident this is judgment for you and this is going to begin the process for them to be reintegrated in the affections of prospero they first have to repent and do it willingly uh, by this so repentance is the only way to be forgiven is suggested and so prospero becomes an architect or a dramaturge of of natural justice which when he uses the storm to bring them to the island and he acts like god doing the same thing that we saw happen to jonah when god causes the storm and wrecks his ship in order for jonah then to go do what he was told to do at the beginning which is to preach repentance to the ninevites Remember, he didn't do it because he didn't want the Ninevites to be forgiven, and he, was, he, he knew that God, being gracious, would probably forgive the Ninevites, and that's the very last thing he wants. He wants the Ninevites to be damned. He wants them to get what they deserve, and he knows that God is more gracious than he and is likely to forgive them, and they're likely to repent, which is why God's sending him. And all he is is pronouncing judgment, but, but God will use it for a different purpose. 
and here we see something of the same sort of thing, the analogy going on here, I think, in Prospero's activity in producing the tempest. And remember, it's called the tempest. So that the tempest here is part of the art, but it's just the, it's the frown that hides a gracious smile at the beginning of the play. And the gracious smile is none other than that of Prospero who wants to be resolved and take some responsibility for his negligence when he uh, dep deputed his brother and gave him his powers and didn't oversee it. There's a, there's a little bit of culpability being admitted here. Um, comments or questions here? I'm fast running out of time. But you can see that we now have the machinery, the supernatural machinery, even in the third act. We haven't seen anything like that in the plays thus far. It's not, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, we do have the imagination waking up in the third, and we have the playwright affecting magic, as it were, to reconcile things, but we don't have supernatural figures coming in. And here we do, and this is why I say this is the most Christian of plays. It's more explicitly supernatural. It's not like Macbeth, where there are witches. Here we have the gracious actions of the dramaturge figure, a dramaturge figure that really seems to me a, a very godlike even. So it's not just Shakespeare. Uh, again, as the, the Coleridgean reading has, it's not just about Shakespeare and about art. It's effectively uh, how um, God works on the stage of life. So act four is back in Prospero's cell, and now we have the three, the father, the daughter, and the beloved Ferdinand together. And Prospero starting to, okay, I gave you a little bit of hard work, and now softening a little bit. Because he's seen enough, he's watched from a distance, he's heard them uh, speak to each other, he sees that Ferdinand deserves his daughter, and he's happy, delighted that she has a man like this. And so his first speech, if I have too austerely punished you, your compensation makes amends. For I have given you here a third of mine own life, or that for which I live, who once again I render to thy hand. All thy vexations were but my trials of thy love, and thou hast strangely stood the test. Here, afore heaven, I ratify this my rich gift. O Ferdinand, do not smile at me when I boast her off. For thou shalt find she will outstrip all praise and make it halt behind her. Miranda, he admires his own daughter. He delights in her. And Ferdinand, I do believe it against an oracle. Then, as my gift and thine own acquisition, worthily purchased, take my daughter. But if thou dost break her virgin knot before, all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy rite be ministered. No sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow, but barren hate. Sour eyed disdain and discord shall bestrew the union of your bed with weeds so loathly that you shall hate it both. Therefore, take heed as Hymen's lamps shall light you. Now, Hymen is the goddess of, of chastity. In marriage, it's a, uh, the goddess of marriage. Don't consummate your marriage before the marriage. Wait to that. Like, it's like, okay, and if you do, I'm going to curse you that your marriage will be not a garden, but a place full of weeds, and it'll be barren, etc. So, quite the speech. You're welcome. I, I, you're just wonderful. And it, but if you do this, then, okay, as I hope for quiet days, says Ferdinand, fair issue, that is children, and long life with such love as tis now, the murkiest den, the most opportune place, the strongest suggestion, or, or our worser genius can, can, shall never melt mine honor into lust, to take away the edge of that day's celebration, when I shall think, or Phoebus's steeds are foundered, or night kept chained below. Barely spoke. Sit then and talk with her. She is thine own. What? Ariel, my industrious servant, Ariel, enter Ariel. Ariel, what would my potent master? Here I am. 
Thou and thy meaner fellows your last service shall did worthily perform, and I must use you in such another trick. Go bring the rabble, or whom I, gave, I give thee power, here to this place, incite them to quick motion, for I must bestow upon the eyes of this young couple some vanity of mine art. It is my promise, and they expect it from me. Presently, I, with a twink, before you can say, come and go, and breathe twice and cry so-so, each one tripping on his toe will be here with mop and, and mow. Do you love me, master? No. Dearly, my delicate Ariel, do not approach till thou dost hear me call. Well, I conceive. Off he goes. Okay. Look thou be true. Do not give dalliance too much the rain. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire of the blood. Be more abstemious, or else, good night your vow. And this is back to them, telling them again, don't get too carried away, because he sees them now being a little bit affectionate, and they're like, don't, don't give dalliance too much of the rain. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. Be more abstemious. Or else, good night, your vow. I warrant you, sir, the white, cold, virgin snow upon my heart abates the ardor of my liver. Wow. Now come, my Ariel, bring a corollary. Rather than want a spirit, appear and pertly, no tongue, all eyes be silent. Now Iris enters and Ceres and so forth. So now we get the mask proper. And you will note that uh, on entry here, we have various goddesses associated with the harvest. And there's a sense of consummation and a celebration. Uh, there, there, there will be a feast. But again, all of nature is participating in this marriage. And uh, C.S. Lewis will use these as well in his Narnia, and he's directly uh, um, probably referring to the Tempest. But other works as well will invoke these Greek uh, and Roman pagan goddesses and gods in order to illustrate the harmony of Christian marriage. So all of nature, and re they represent forces of nature. So even nature, not just grace, but nature, will celebrate uh, what Prospero is seeking to bring about here. So I'm going to skip over the speeches between Ceres and Iris uh, and so forth, but all of these, and then Juno, Juno again, who is the goddess of marriage will be here to make sure that the marriage takes place. Now, and Juno, honor, riches, marriage, blessing, long continuance and increasing hourly joys be still upon you. Juno sings her blessings on you. Ceres, earths increase, voice and plenty, barns and garners never empty, vines with clustering branches growing, plants with goodly burthen bowing. Spring come to you at the farthest, in the very end of harvest, scarcity and wants thou shall shun you. Ceres blessing, so is on you. And then Ferdinand, this is a most majestic vision and harmonious, charmingly. As I said, the harmony is repeatedly referred to here in this mask. And now a mask, I've referred to repeatedly, there's the definitions, it's just a Wikipedia one, but it's, it's correct. It's an elaborate theater style performance and it very choreographed dancing. And uh, lavish costumes, very great spectacle. And it tends to be put on in aristocratic homes. As I say, M Milton will write Comus a mask, but a ma the, the, the form of the mask um, appears in the early 17th century. And it's very popular in aristocratic aristocratic circles and performed at weddings at that and that's the wedding here now remember it is a royal wedding in a sense because he is the duke of milan and he's marrying his daughter is marrying none other than the king of naples son so that's what's ensuing here and prospero spirits which by mine art i have from their confines called to enact my present fancies let me live here ever so rare a wondered father and a wife makes this place paradise. So there's a paradise on earth, a reference uh, to the 
messianic banquet with the bridegroom and the bride and the all of nature praising uh, the consummation of the gracious Lord Christ that loves his bride. In this, Iris speak, you nymphs called naiads of the windering brooks with your sedged crowns and ever harmless looks, leave your crisp channels and on this green land answer your summons, Juno does command. Come temperate nymphs and help to celebrate a contract of true love, be not too late. And now they come in. And now at this point, in the midst of all this, Prospero has to stop himself because he's forgotten that there's a plot afoot to kill him and Miranda. He's forgot about it because it's insignificant, but still it's happening. So there's a danger that Prospero goes back into the old forgetful Prospero caught up in his books and in his idealistic schemes that he forgets the world around him and doesn't act in time. And that's what it's so in the middle of the service, in the middle of the dance, he stops and says, I've got to take care of that right now. So then he goes, and then in the side, Prospero, I would forgot that foul conspiracy of the beast Caliban and his confederates against my life. The minute of their plot is almost come. And then to the spirits, well done, avoid, no more. And then Ferdinand, this is strange. Your father's in some passion that works him strongly. And Miranda, never till this day saw I him touched with anger, so distempered. And then the famous speech, the famous speech of Prospero, and it really is a famous speech. Um, you do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and uh, are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Sir, I am vexed. Bear with my weakness. My old brain is troubled. Be not disturbed with my infirmity, if you be pleased. Retire into my cell and there repose. A turn or two I'll walk to still my beating mind. So he interrupts this terrific speech on the spectacle, the ideal spectacle of a marriage and what it, what it connotes, which is the heavenly messianic banquet with uh, the interruption that he has to go and that's why he's back. So there's this mixture here of the realistic duties that he needs to perform with the heavenly service that they've just seen performed before them. And we wish your peace. Now, some critics, uh, critique Prospero's speech so it sort of falls apart at the end. It's supposed to fall apart at the end because he's vexed. The, the enchantment is sort of broken for him. He's, he's irritated. He has to act. So then he goes and acts in order to arrest these characters who are coming to murder him. And uh, I'll pick it up in Act 5, Scene 1. Oh, I have one minute. There you go. Skip all over that. Pros Prospero in his magic robes and Ariel. Now, I've told you about the magic robes. The magic robes are those of his art, he, right? And he wears the robes of everyone who wears robes. Now, people, uh, again, in, from a pagan perspective or a secular humanist perspective, these are just robes. But robes are worn by the Levitical, those that bear offices of the Levites. Priests, teachers, judges, pastors, police, lawyers, etc. They wear the robes of office. These are magical robes. He's serving the office here of a, an ambassador for Christ. That's the office. And the arts are being used to that end. So he's perfected his arts to the point where now they're servicing God, serving God's purposes in this little place. So in his magic robes and Ariel with him, now does my project gather to a head. My charms crack not. My spirits obey, and time goes upright with his carriage. How's the day? On the sixth hour, at which time, my Lord, you said our work should cease. Now, the sixth hour 
in the gospel narratives is midday. Right? At the moment of the crucifixion, when the heavens goes dark, and grace is then performed at the sixth hour. I did say so when first I raised the tempest. Say, my spirit, how fares the king and his followers confined together in the same fashion as you gave in charge? And they are there now. And he said, your charm so strongly works them that if you now help, beheld them, your affections would become tender. Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, sir, were I human, and mine shall. So now he, he's gone from the anger and he's confined them. And now the completion of it is that if I were human, I would be generous towards them, and now I will. Because now his art has achieved its end of reconciliation and harmony, and mine shall. Hast thou, which art but air, a touch, a feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply, passion as they be kindlier moved than thou art? Though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, yet with my nobler reason, grace-infused reason, with my nobler reason, against my fury do I take part. So the, the sins of the men that have wronged him in the one hand and the grace will cover it up. And I will judge them in accordance with, with the grace of God and not their merit. That's how they will treat. So he is a, he is a Christ-like figure here. Against my fury do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. They being penitent, the sole drift of my purpose, purpose doth extend, not a frown further. Go release them, Ariel, my charms I'll break, their senses I'll restore, and they shall be themselves. I'll fetch them, sir. And then in response to this, now that his purposes are ended, he is going to dispense with his arts. The grace of God being done, his arts, he rightly, because remember, the whole play ensued because he put too much trust in his wisdom and his knowledge and his arts. He neglected the grace of God and his means. He tried to do everything himself. Having now experienced the grace of God come down upon him and upon those that he's now harmonized with, this final speech, ye elves of hills, and I do not take this to be Shakespeare's swan song. It's not Shakespeare speaking. It's a man who represents the grace of God in all of his actions. Now, that could be Shakespeare, okay, but I think it's more than autobiographical. It's the artist rightly understood. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back, you demi-puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make, whereof the you not bites. And you, whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun. Note that he's bedimmed the sun. Pitch black. Clear reference to Good Friday. Called forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vault set roaring war. I'd set the discord, and it's all brought here. And to the dread rattling thunder have I given bolt, and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt. The strong based promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the, pline and, the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped and let them forth by my so potent art. Again, re reference to the resurrection. Graves pop open. But this rough magic I here abjure. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses, that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff and bury it certain fathoms in the earth and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. And so forth. I'm gonna stop it there and not go to the end. But you can see that he is adjuring his arts for something greater to which his arts were an analogy an analogy, it's some, but he recognizes the limitations even of art to the grace of God. And, but his art is pointing to that here. That's how the play ends. That's how I think the play is meant to be read, not as a, some sort of colonialist political commentary uh, about ethics towards the tribes, the natives. It's not about Shakespeare 
uh, in his autobiographical, it's his last, this is Shakespeare speaking, it's about God's grace. That, that's Shakespeare's The Christian Playwright. Anyway, thank you very much. I realize